Greetings. I'm glad you joined me today. Today we're going to be looking at neighbors um, in Luke 10, 25 through 37. So let me just say that a lot of the material I'll be using, I, I did get from Jay Vernon McGee today. He really enjoyed this passage and he has a lot of good things. A lot of the commentary I'm using is based on him. And one of the things he says about this is that this is Dr. Luke showing how he majored in parable, uh, parables. And that's kind of in contrast to Mark who majored in miracles. So this is one of the parables in, <clears throat> of, the, of the Good Samaritan. And Dr. Luke, I mean, uh, pardon me, J. Vernon McGee said that a lot of literary cri critics have deemed this story of Jesus is to be one of the greatest stories ever told. And it usually means about the way he puts it together, how, how um, the length of it and how many that he has the message in the story. So we'll be looking at that as we go through. Well, one of the things I thought about is that um, how this concept of the Good Samaritan, um, whether people know the Bible or not, has permeated our culture. And so one of the, the things I thought about is a insurance company that we all know of that has used, used an adaptation of that for their tagline, like a good neighbor. And I have a clip to one of their commercials that I like that I'm gonna put in the um, comments afterwards. Um, it's a little bit older commercial, but it shows what happens when you have a good neighbor that shows up and helps you. And when, when you're connected to someone that's not quite as good a neighbor. And so it's one of my favorites. And another way, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Another way that, um, let me go back when it's permeated is that most states have what we call a Good Samaritan law and, and it's maybe a little bit different versions. And this is the one in Texas, in Texas, a person in, who in good faith administers emergency care at the scene of an emergency or in a hospital is not liable for civic damages for an act performed during the emergency unless the act is willfully or wantonly ne negligent. So that means if you were to stop at the scene of a crime and um, you inadvertently or maybe what you did didn't help or you inadvertently did the wrong thing that no one can hold you liable because you were acting in good faith. And that's a good thing um, because it does give us in this world of suing, it gives grants us a little bit, it grants us the ability to take those actions. But neither what the insurance company is saying or what the good law is saying is exactly what Jesus is talking about. But this does give you an idea of how this concept of the good Samaritan, a good neighbor um, does permeate our culture's thinking. And why many people think that if they perform those deeds, they are living good lives and should inherit eternal life. So let's look at our passage. And um, the first section is entitled The Exchange. And this is talking about um, a, a teacher of the law who is going to ask Jesus a question. And we'll talk about him as we go through. So we're in Luke 10, 25 in the Christian Standard Bible, which is what the quarterly is using. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This one verse is just packed full of themes. So let's look at it. And, and I forgot that our aim for today is that God wants us to treat others as we would want to be treated and to bless those who can't bless us back. All right, so we look at what we're seeing here. First, there is this um, notation that he is an expert in the law. Now, some translations actually say lawyer um, because that's how the Greek word is used. And it is talking about it, one of those scribes who is proficient in the law and therefore he teaches the law. He is an expert in the law. That's what makes him a lawyer. And I, I so now let me stop and just say what I'm gonna say now is me talking. But I have to wonder um, if Luke and his, the inspiration, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, didn't specifically use this word for, in this uh, phrase, because he is going to use the word teacher for Jesus. 
you know, teacher has the concept of rab rabbi, has the concept, you know, there's rabbi, someone who's knowledgeable about the scriptures, and then not quite as honorable or, um, is the phrase teacher. So he's not giving Jesus the highest recognition that he could. And so maybe these particular words used for him are not the highest uh, representation they could be for his profession because he is in acting more like we would think of the lawyers, like someone standing, um, bringing you to testify, bringing you to stand witness. And we're going to see this, uh, this exchange between this expert and Jesus be more in this uh, almost in a courtroom way of them, of them talking to each other. <coughs> I happened to hear a law, I happened to hear, hear yesterday a writer who has been a lawyer. He was a lawyer for 20 years and he defended civil criminal cases for very vile sex crimes for the most part. And he talked about how he had to separate that life from his wife at home. And then how he had friends with the prosecution attorney sometimes, very good friends. But in the courtroom, you would have never known it because they were focused on what their purpose was in their path. And so that's part of what we see in the wording here because the expert in the law wanted to test Jesus. Now, we know Jesus always knew when that was gonna happen, that when they were, when their, their motives was out of testing. And it's a reminder to us that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 9, let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. So <clears throat> uh, it's, that's not the right approach to have that he was, but he, he's going to test him. Jesus knows he's going to test. He's trying to test him. He's going to try to trap him once again into saying something that he can't substantiate. So he's going to say, and he's made this reference to the teacher. What must I do? Okay, we can stop there because we know there is nothing we can do. And I'm going to show you, let me show you, take you to another verse. In, and I was just reading this passage this week in Psalms 49. Oh, right, this is just something, just something. There is nothing we can do. We can't do anything to inherit eternal life because we aren't capable of it. We'll see that through the passage. We are just not um, set up to be capable of doing it. So he wants to do. He doesn't want to have faith. He wants to do. And so then he says eternal life. So there's a couple different things here. First off, in Daniel 12, 2, and because he is an expert, he would know this. In Daniel 12, 2, it's, it says, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, and some to eternal life, and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. So he has a concept, he should know the concept of the difference in eternal life, but perhaps he's just looking at eternal life and he wants to do something to inherit it. And in Psalms 49, we see that in 10 and 12, but really through this whole passage, this whole Psalms is this concept. And it is that you cannot buy your ransom from God. You can't do it with money. You can't do it with actions. It is only by belief that you get to inherit eternal life, not by actions. All right, so then this next section, and I'm still in it, the exchange is 26 through 28. So Jesus is going to do, um, because he is the master teacher, he is going to ask the, the expert a question, answer his question, with another question. And what that forces the expert to do is to answer his own question. This is a really good defense, really good, good witness strategy stuff. 
So Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? He asked him, how do you read it? So he knows that this is an expert. So now he wants the expert to say, what is in the law? And so the um, expert responds in verse 27 and 28. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him, that's Jesus. Do this and you will live. All right, so our, our expert in the law has quoted two very important passages that do speak to this, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Although he did, left out, he did leave out, and this is a passage that devout Jews said um, twice a day by heart, but he left out, I am the Lord your God, the only Lord, and therefore um, love your God. And so he left that part out. And then the part about love your neighbors is, is from uh, Leviticus 19, 18. What Jesus was hoping he would say. And so there are a couple of things Jesus was hoping. First, he is wanting to drill into the Pharisee, the scribe to look beyond what he thought of neighbors because Jesus knew that the Pharisees didn't even think that all the Jews were their neighbors, that there were Jews that were poorer than they were, that, weren't, that didn't live as righteously. So they didn't qualify as neighbors. So Jesus wants to challenge him on his thinking of who a neighbor is. And so therefore, when he's saying do this, it's this enlarging of who his neighbor is. <clears throat> and he also um, wants the, the scribe to get behind the law, to get to the heart of the law, not just to know the law, but to put it in practice. And then one thing I failed to mention is that Jesus, in the way he model, is modeling his life for us, teaches us something really important. When somebody asks us a difficult question, the best thing to do, the right thing to do, is to always point them back to scripture. And that is what Jesus did. He went back to scripture, back to what they knew, back to what they couldn't disagree with. So that's always, um, once again, something that's being um, modeled for us to do. So Jesus is really wanting to push in this concept of loving your neighbor and loving your neighbor as yourself. And those just can't be words. It has to be actions. And that takes us to our key doctrine for today, the Christian and the social order. That Christians should work to provide for the orphaned, the needy, the abused, the aged, the help, and the sick. And <clears throat> the scripture reference is one of my favorites from James 127, when I learned as a young um, teenager. And if you haven't, it's one to really think about. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So when you boil religion down, it is um, looking after orphans and widows those people who, are, people who are in need. And that is throughout the Old Testament, over and over, God's demand, God's number one demand from his people is to see to the needy. All right, so the, <clears throat> our friend, the expert, we see his answer in 1029, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So we're just drilling. He's getting, in doing this, he's um, doing what Jesus is wanting to do. He's digging into, well, who exactly is my neighbor that I should be helping out? And because he wants to justify himself, justify his lack of love that he knows he has for some people. 
Our principle is that Jesus exposes our attempts to justify ourselves. He does it in many ways in my life and probably in yours. And we should watch for that. And we are going, oh no, that's me too that he's talking about. So why do people think that they can obtain eternal life by doing religious works, by being a good neighbor? Um, and what tactics do people use to justify themselves? What, okay, so um, in the last couple of weeks with the uh, tremendous storm we had, we did see many, many acts of good Samaritans helping their neighbors out. And all of it came from a, a real concern, but did it come from loving God? And so what things are you doing in an effort to justify yourself? And let us ask God to expose those actions to ourselves um, so that we can take action based on what he tells you. And we want to ask God for the courage to be able to take those actions on what we learn. Well, I just know Jesus is like, Thank you for asking. Because when people asked him a question like that, he knew exactly where he was going to go. And <coughs> it's always amazing to me that they just did that because they just opened the door, the door for Jesus to take them deeper, which is what Jesus wants all of us to do is to let him take us deeper. And so the way he's going to do it is by telling a story. Stories are so powerful. And so we're gonna be in 30 through 32 at the moment. Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. And a priest happened to be going down that road when he saw him, he passed by the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he saw, when he arrived at the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. So I have a map of the area so we can think about what the road to, from Jerusalem to Jericho looks like. And so Jerusalem is here. And then here's a little white blurry road that, that really covers, it said the road to Jericho, to Jericho. So it's a little bit of a windy <clears throat> road with steep hills and there are caves along the way that thieves can hide in. And it has this unique terrain. In, in addition to that, Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level but Jericho is 800 feet below sea level, which is why we always say, even if we're going north, they went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It makes my ears pop just to think about that dif difference in the altitude that you have to go through. And I have maybe told you before, but uh, Mark Twain got to go to the um, Holy Lands in the, the mid-1800s. and um, <clears throat> went on some and visiting different places and they went in a group on horseback a lot of times and he talked about this kind of terrain and how dangerous even then it was and how um people would hide in the caves and would attack them so they had guards with them that they paid them to help you know stay as act as bodyguards for them and were knowledgeable about the people around and you know, maybe with the, the bribes and stuff could keep the thieves away. Of course, they were never 100% confident of the people they were paying to protect them was, were going to pay them. So I always had this great vision from reading um, the book, Innocent Abroad, uh, of the terrain of the Holy Lands. It made it more real for me. Uh, and, and one thing that we want to note here is that the people are going in the story are going from Jerusalem to Jericho. So they're going away from Jerusalem. So our priest and our Levi are 
for whatever reason, are not going to be taking part in their temple work in the days to, in the immediate future. So they do not have the excuse of that they have to stay away from a diseased body or perhaps a dead body, um, like if they were going to Jerusalem, um, where they had, they didn't want to for their week in the temple and they didn't want to mess up their make their bodies defiled. So they're going away from Jerusalem, away from their temple work. All right, the rest of the story is, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine. And he, then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. So when you look at the map of the area and just remind you, Samaria is here in the middle and Galilee is up at the top. Jericho's here and then Judea, this is in Judea. All right, the Samaritans were much hated people by the Jews in this time period. And during the exile of the first kingdom, uh, well, actually they, they brought Gentiles in and then, exile, then some of the Jews came back, some of the Jews were left. So the people in Samaria during the time of Jesus were considered half Gentile, half Jew. They weren't really Jewish. And so they were not acceptable. And so many people, they needed to travel from Judea to Galilee would actually walk all the way around Samaria, even though the, the path to Jerusalem, the, the quickest was through Samaria. They wouldn't even travel through Samaria. They didn't want to have anything to do with Samarians. They didn't have any regard for Samarians. And yet that is who our hero is today. Let me go back to the scriptures for a minute. When we get to see these powerful words, Dr. Luke, is going to tell us exactly how the man took care of the injured man and that he treated him with oil and uh, olive oil and wine. And that was something very, that was what they did in that culture at that time. That's how they used, they thought they were healing ornaments and they often made a salve out of the two things, oil of oil and wine. And so this is um, something Dr. Luke would pay attention to and tell us to, and explain to us about how he was being taken care of. And we see that he, the man took such good care of this gentleman and um, he's gonna put him on his own horse. So it means he walked and take him into town and find a room. So here's a, Photo, here's a painting. There are a lot of paintings of this um, incident out on the web. I liked this one because it does show the Pharisee and the Levites in the background, not, not wanting to have anything to do. And the man took him into town, stayed with him overnight. And then obviously his requirements for being on the road were um, had some sort of essential nature to them that he needed to move on but he still took care of the man by providing um, money and asking the innkeepers to take care of him and promising that if it could cost more, he would pay for him when he came back through. So he went over and up beyond taking care of the man. So Jesus communicates with us in ways that we can understand. He's telling the story so that the uh, expert in the law can understand the point, can understand who his neighbor is. <clears throat> but you know, sometimes when Jesus does that, it shocks us, shakes us to our roots. And that is exactly what's happened to the expert in the story and to all those who are listening, because the hero is the Samaritan, the last person they would have thought the person that they disdain, 
was the hero, was the person. And even more, the Samaritan was the one that followed God's law. He understood what it meant to be a good neighbor. And that neighbor had nothing to do with territory. But it had to do with showing God's compassion toward others. God desires that we assist those that he puts in our uh, path. Um, those who need our help in very practical ways. So how do most people react when they see someone in a desperate situation? What do onlookers think about Jesus when they see how we respond to others in need? Those are hard questions to ask. And <clears throat> I know for myself that uh, for many reasons, because I'm alone, I'm not a very large person, I have no way to physically defend myself, that I tend to stay away from people that we see that could need my help, like the people that work the corners. And we know that <clears throat> sometimes there are scans behind those, but some of those people look pretty bad. And sometimes I think I don't really know how to help them in the right way, uh, but there are ways we can help. You know, Bruce Wilkinson, who wrote the prayer of Jabez, and he talks about how he keeps bananas and bottled water in his car, and he will give uh, a pack of that to people when he sees like that. And then he always keeps a, uh, extra money in his billfold so that when, and, and at the time it was $200. So if he saw someone and God prompted him, this is the person you need to help. It was really some incredible people, some very interesting stories he told, and not always about the right, the things that you might consider the right thing that they bought with it. But when he found out the whole story, there was always more to the story. So he would, if God told him that this is someone you should help, he would just walk up to them and say, God told me I should help you and hand them the money. That sounds really good. And I wish I could do this. And I just haven't gotten to that place yet. So what are some practical ways we can show openness to others? And what are changes we might need to make to be more inclusive? So on this question, I would just encourage you to think about the time is coming when we will be able to gather again. And, but because of all the changes that have happened, maybe we'll have to make changes in our group. Uh, what are we willing to make in our group to make other people feel included? We need to. Um, and what does it mean to be able to be good neighbors, even within our Sunday school world? So let's think about that. Because we also could have people who, as we're all coming back to church, maybe are ready for um, got an experience with God. And may, so maybe we'll be bringing more people back to church than ever when uh, we're able to return. So be thinking about what would God want us to be able to do? All right, now Jesus is going to give the challenge. We're in verses 36 through 37. Which of these do you, which of these three do you think proved to be a good neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the one who showed mercy to him. He said, then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Okay, so my cat, my cat's joining me in my lap if you see her tail. So when he says proved, oh, there is a concept there about looking beyond boundaries, borders. My neighbor is not the person that lives, not just the person that lives next door to me. Neighbor, the concept of neighbor is much bigger. And so proving has to do with those, that part of it. And so we see that um, it's an, an, uh, um, we have to show mercy. We have to show the mercy that God showed us in uh, bringing us to see Jesus. And it is through that mercy that we need to show other people. And um, here we know we, we can be pretty confident that the expert in the law 
had to be thinking about the people that he didn't see as neighbors that he wasn't treating in the right way. And that this was the command that we have to show mercy, we have to show love to others. Even, and so I was thinking about this too during the week, that this is what we see Jesus do throughout his ministry. As these people continue to test and to try him, he is always responding to them in God's mercy and God's love, always pointing to them and pretty much answering their questions. But even when he didn't answer their questions, he was still answering their questions, right? He was always showing mercy, even to his proven enemies. That is even a harder step for us. So this is coming from J. Vernon McGee. And this is part of why I like. So we, he says that we can find three philosophies of life in this passage. There is the thief who says, and I, I don't think I typed this right, but what you have is mine. It just doesn't look right when I read it. What you have is mine. The priest and the Levite said, what I have is mine. But the good Samaritan said, what I have belongs to you. So let's look, look at the story in a deeper, in a, diff, a deeper, deeper perception. So a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And J. Vernon McGee said that this is a picture of humanity, that the race from Adam, that was in the Garden of Eden with Jesus. And that just like the man going down from Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem's the place where they approached God, they went to Jericho, the accused city. And in our world, we see that humanity has fallen and it's helpless to help ourselves and that mankind was dead in, trans in trespasses and sin. And that's very much like the, men in the, the man in the story who had fallen among thieves was half, left half dead. And we know thieves are a picture of the devil. John 8, 44, so the devil was a murderer from the beginning and several other passages talk about the devil as a, pre, uh, uh, the devil as a thief. The priest represented ritualism and, and ceremonialism and neither of those things can save us. The Levite represented legalism that can't save us either. But the Samaritan is where you go when ritualism, ceremonialism, and legalism fail. And that's where Christ came to the earth. And he can bind up the brokenhearted and he can take the lost sinner, half dead, lost in trespasses and sins, and help him. So there's this comparison that Christ, the Samaritan, and that whole concept that the Samaritan was the one that follow the law had to be <clears throat> um, just really bothering the expert. So part of what we're learning is that anyone you can help is your neighbor and that includes your proven enemies. So I found this map of Duncanville to remind us that our challenge is not just our neighbors. Now. And where I live, if I was just going to try to legalistically live by this um, verse, I don't really have any neighbors because the, there's a vacant lot on one side of me and the back of my lot backs up to, if I could get to it, would back up to um, a, a, a practice baseball field. Um, there's a lot of woods between my other neighbor and then directly across the street from me a, a long way away um, is just a, a, a street pole. The, the neighbors are really catty corners. So I, I don't really have any neighbors. So I could easily say, oh, well, I, I do good for my neighbors. Um, but it's more than just your physical neighbors that live next to you. So Jesus expects his followers to extend grace for all people. So who in your life could be called a good Samaritan right now? And maybe during this year, there have been people who have helped you out. And then what can you do to help them? And how are you challenged by Jesus' story 
In what ways could you demonstrate your neighborly love for someone this week? Love, not place, reduces neighborhood. That God desires that we can love and care for everyone he places in our lives. So thank you for being here today. And let's pray. So Father, thank you for showing us how to love our neighbors and for the opportunity you've given us to love each other and to love our enemies. So just open our eyes for the opportunities that you're placing in front of us and give us the courage then to step forward and take action um, to fulfill those things. And help us to show your, the mercy you've shown us to everyone we need. Keep us safe and bring us back together. We ask these things in your son's name. In the name of Jesus, amen. See you soon.